will be Chris Mateo from the Philippine National Day Association, Mahmoud Zaria from the Council on American Islamic Relations, Sacramento Valley, and Leanne Duan from the California Chinese Engineers Association. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you to our candidates, uh, Dr. Barra and Mr. Grant, for participating in this panel. I will go over our process for this panel. We will proceed. Each candidate will have two minutes to provide opening statements. We ask that our candidates focus on their policy platforms and not on their opponents. After the opening statements, our moderators will ask you policy questions, and each candidate will have one minute to respond. When our question time concludes, each candidate will have an opportunity to provide one minute closing statement. With that, let's get started. For our opening statements, let's start with Dr. Ami Berra. Great, thank you. And I want to thank APAPA for their 17th annual candidate forum. APAPA has been a leader in the Asian American community and thank you for that leadership. You know, when I think about the United States of America, we are a great nation, but our greatness comes from the values of who we are. We have to be a welcoming community and a welcoming country. We're a generation of immigrants, one generation after another, bringing their culture, their traditions, their religions, all woven together. That's my story. My parents immigrated here from India in the 1950s for that American dream, and I'm a product of that American dream. That brings us to that second value, that second value is about paying it forward, making sure our children and grandchildren have a better future, but also making sure that we protect the promises we've made to our parents and grandparents. And the third value is my profession. As a doctor, I believe every American, if they get sick, should be able to go get the care that they need, and they should never go bankrupt if they um, have a catastrophic illness. So thank you for doing this. I look forward to the, the vibrancy of ideas. Oops. I've still got one minute, so um, that never happens, a politician not using all of his time. Um, look, the this, this stakes in this election um, are, are, are quite high because what we're talking about are that set of values, who we are as a country, what will we leave our, our children and grandchildren and that next generation. And in truth, that's why you know, I am glad that APAPA is putting this voter forum on. Your vote matters in our democracy. Your vote is your voice. So get engaged, get out the vote, make sure people are engaged, regardless of which candidate you're supporting, but you've got to use your voice, and that's why the selection is incredibly important. Thank you. Great, well thank you for uh, inviting me, Papa. It's great to be here. I'm Andrew Grant, and I'm running for US Congress in District 7. I'm a bit of a fish out of water. I'm not in District 7 right now, so uh, I need to get back out there and, and spend time with everyone. I've been doing a lot of door-to-door, -door, as some of you may have seen, uh, and really understanding the issues. But let me share a little bit about myself and then a couple examples, really leaders and mentors uh, that I have uh, valued watching their lives and their success stories, and they have been part of your community for a long, long time. Uh, I will also briefly say, not just hey Papa, thank you for welcoming me, but I'm also back at Sac State. I know I'm a fish out of water, not in the district, but I'm back at my university where I have a degree from, so thank you, Sac State, for putting this on. Um, but suffice to say, I'm Californian, born and raised in the East Bay. I was uh, commissioned from the United States Naval Academy in 1995 and served in the Marine Corps, two combat tours uh, overseas as a Marine. Um, I, I left service and uh, accepted an appointment at the U.S. Department of State and served as a diplomat for about three years as well, combating the threat of terrorists trying to acquire and use nuclear weapons, something, of course, that the federal government needs to maintain a clear focus on, on denying that ever happens. Yes, I was an intelligence officer in that capacity. I worked at the Defense Intelligence Agency as well. Uh, I've worked at the interagency in Washington, D.C. I've testified before Congress. I've met with many members and worked with them on critical issues for the United States. Uh, but also, um, after having served in Homeland Security uh, after the U.S. Department of State, I decided to come back to California, the state that I love, the state that I've uh, always lived in if I wasn't uh, in the military or in, in public service, and started a small business with my wife. Uh, we ran a little a nursery gift shop, mom and pop, truly. And if anyone has uh, owned a business in California, you know the difficulties of meeting payroll here and the other challenges for the business climate that we have. 
I also worked at, uh, as an executive at Ray Leaks for about five years and then was recently the CEO of the World Trade Center. Let me go back to those uh, individuals I mentioned when I wanted to discuss really that American dream. The first person who's here with us today, C.C. Yen, is, is one of those individuals uh, that has an amazing background. The second one is State Senator Janet Nguyen, who came as a refugee from Vietnam and came up in the ranks of politics and is now serving as a state senator. Sorry, Mr. They're individuals that understand the American dream. And I'll just close by saying that it's not government that they asked for for handouts to develop that dream. It was they themselves. And those are the kind of people that I want to support coming from your community. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you, candidates. We will move on to our questions. Uh, the first question is uh, this year. The Me Too movement brought to light a number of sexual abuse scandals that unfolded in Hollywood, in the corporate world, and Capitol Hill. Reported instances of sexual harassment behavior has forced lawmakers and high-profile legislative staff out of office. Since then, dozens of legislative efforts have been discussed to address workplace sexual harassment but many argue that these measures don't address workplace cultures that discourage victims from reporting pervasive harassment. As an elected official, what would you do to address sexual harassment in your office, and how would you keep your colleagues accountable? We'll start with Mr. Grant. Uh, Mr. Grant. Sure. Those are crimes. Let's just answer for what they are. They're crimes. They're not giving people the same opportunities that everyone deserves in any workplace environment, whether it be in public service or otherwise. Uh, I find it interesting that we're spending a lot of conversation around uh, areas where we actually already have uh, laws that should be enforced on the books, and we should place an emphasis on understanding what the issues are, enabling people who need to whistleblow and share uh, if there's a possible harassment case, and then do full, thorough investigations on what's happening. There's never been a question or a second in my mind where I haven't questioned the importance of full transparency and disclosure and understanding what those issues are. And then if criminal activity is, is, not, is, is present, going after it, or if someone can clear their name because the allegations were false, then moving forward with the right workplace environment. No question. So elected officials have to hold themselves to the higher, highest standards. We're asking for the public trust, so you have to have zero tolerance. And in Congress, we have passed legislation led by Jackie Spear to raise that standard, but we have to do more. We also have to make sure victims feel like they can bring those complaints forward. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about what was happening in Washington, D.C. last week with the Supreme Court nomination. You know, you had a victim bring an, uh, an allegation forward. I found Dr. Ford's testimony credible. The young girls, the young boys around this country are watching. Other victims are watching. I heard my Republican colleagues also say they found her testimony credible. Let's do the right thing. Let's allow the FBI to investigate and find the facts, and then wherever the facts lead, that's what we should do. But the country is watching, and that generation and other victims are watching. And if we want to allow them to have voice, we have to do the right thing and let the facts lead where they will. including Stephen Clark in Sacramento, continue to ignite the debate of police brutality. Accountability and race relations across the state and the country, what is your take on this issue and how do you plan to address it? This starts with Dr. Barrett and then <coughs> Stephon Clark's death was, was a tragedy. You know, um, children lost their father. Um, some grandparents lost their, their grandson. We have to push for full transparency here. We have to know what happened, and then we have to try to figure out how do you prevent the next tragic death. You know, this past week, we lost a, a sheriff deputy as well. That was another tragic loss of a young man. And we've got to find a way to bridge this gap and find the, the peace between the communities that most need law enforcement um, and law enforcement. And I think that comes from transparency, getting to the truth, finding out what happened, and then making those changes so you prevent But again, it comes from full transparency. Thank you. Mr. Grant? Great. Yeah. Nothing there I wouldn't disagree with. Full transparency, full disclosure, full understanding. 
a federal government providing funding down to the lowest levels possible. Sometimes in certain cases in the local law enforcement community, they don't have the right uh, capabilities or resources to do a full investigation. So in that case, it's either a partnership with the state or the feds to identify what's wrong, or they can do it with additional resources. No question there. Let me go back to one thing that was uh, one comment uh, related to the previous question, and I'll just be clear. I have worked with uh, Robert Mueller before. I worked with members on his FBI team, and I support the investigation of Robert Mueller trying to figure out what happened with Russia in our elections. I think that's something to be supported, and I think we'll find that, uh, that justice will be served in that case. Thank you. I'm going to ask a third question. Uh, this year, two giant wildfires caused much destruction to California and cost our state at least 845 million in property damages. Experts say that California should prepare to see wildfire as a regular occurrence. What should you do is Congress, representatives, both short and long term, how to address this grave concern? Ms. Grant first. You bet. So when I worked at Homeland Security, I worked within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And in that case, we would go and deploy as a national team supporting uh, these kinds of uh, either prevention or response to these major disasters. In the cases involving fire, there's been a lot of efforts uh, to relax the standards for important forest station management. And I think we need to make sure that those continue. I'm also someone that accepts that temperatures are rising. Climate change is happening. And if you don't read the science, at least understand enough strong and very vital work done on climate change is occurring, and scientists are right. And so, of course, we need to manage uh, how we look at uh, the, the increase in temperatures combined with focusing on proper forest management. And I think in the case of rolling back some of the things that limited us to do that, we'll find there's improvements. I would also add that uh, our UWASA funding, which is Urban Area Security Initiative funding, and other types of funding grants that come back into California to support emergency management activity, need to be fully supported coming from the federal government. So, climate change is real, and we don't have to look any further than what's happening in our state. These fires are now um, regular occurrences, and they're getting worse and worse each year. We had um, devastating droughts a few years ago. So we have to get ahead of this. Yes, we've got to do active forest management and manage our forests better. Yes, you know, last week we passed disaster management relief, but we've got to do more on the front end to prevent these disasters. And that is going to come by Democrats and Republicans working together here in California to manage the forest, to reduce and remove a lot of the dead trees and the, the timber, but then to, to again understand We've got to get ahead of climate change, and unfortunately, we're not doing enough to get ahead and mitigate the, the impact of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Our country continues to experience to see some of the deadliest and most horrific mass shootings. In response to these events, California has enacted some of the strictest gun control laws in the nation. For example, this past Friday, Governor Jerry Brown signed several gun control bills, including one measure that raises the minimum age for buying rifles from 18 to 21. Could you assess the state of gun control in California? Do you believe these policies are too much, not enough, or strike a good balance between preserving the public safety and our Second Amendment rights? We will start with Dr. Barra. Thank you. Um, I think we can be proud to be Californians because we are enacting some of the strictest um, laws to reduce gun violence in our state. Um, I think we can be proud that since the federal government won't do it, we've dedicated $5 million to actually study what is the cause of gun violence, what is causing these mass shootings, what should we do to mitigate and, and try to get ahead of this. That we can be proud of. But there's a lot that Congress needs to do. We should pass universal background checks. We should make sure guns are not ending up in the hands of criminals. We should support and pass an assault weapons ban. You know, these are military grade weapons that shouldn't be out there. Um, and if someone wants to have one of those, 
They ought to be controlled and locked up. They shouldn't be out there in the public. And you know, we should look at bans on um, extended magazines. I'd support all of those, and I think the broad public would as well. I also think we'd be making a mistake if we aren't teachers, because schools should be the safest places for kids to go. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So I'm curious to see what the response will be uh, in the public on, on these decisions made by California. Look, I'm not someone to get in front of what California is going to decide to do. In fact, one of the most important properties if you look at our system is that through a federalist approach, the state of California can make decisions for its local politics different from what we make decisions at the congressional level. Um, but the fact is every time this happens, and you look at the evidence on whether uh, gun-related crime increases or decreases, it continues to go up. B, you will next week watch the incredible amount of gun sales that will occur in California. More guns will come out there. If you go to some of the communities in District 7 or anywhere in this region, who are sometimes struggling more than other places, and you talk about gun control and taking away their guns, what you're talking about is taking away their, with their version of public safety or their, their portion of making sure they can secure their families and their properties themselves. And yet responsible handling is completely important. One measure that we haven't talked about much is gun violence restraining orders, which is a way where if there is a concern, you can go through a due process and decide if someone should be allowed to have guns or not have guns. Thank you. Immigration continues to be an issue at the state and national level. DACA students are afraid and unclear about their future. There are reports of ICE agents conducting raids in the courthouses and schools. At the same time, uh, there are calls at the federal level for stricter immigration rules and enforcements, including building a wall between the United States and Mexico. Amidst these contentious conversations, what do you see your role to be in issues of immigration? We'll start with Mr. Grant and then Dr. Barrett. You bet. Let's go into this a little bit. First of all, I think when you try to come up with comprehensive reform coming from Congress, often you fail on the margins, right? You fail, this is watered down, and this doesn't do what we want to accomplish. So let's just talk about a couple things. Number one, I'm someone that, we, that thinks we can find a pathway to citizenship for DACA. I came out early on saying that that's actually something that the government should and can do, and that's a well-functioning government that mechanically can enable that for people who can come on their, their own accord to the United States. People come here because they're looking for a better life, right? They're not, there's people talk about threats and other things that are happening, sure, in small amounts. People are trying to come here to help build their lives, their family, that American dream I described, with people like Janet and others who have come here and have done that. Um, but we need to find a fair system that makes sure that we account for everyone who's come here. There's many people who've been here for a long time who want to become naturalized. They've been paying taxes, they have great businesses, they've been great citizens. Let's find a way to focus on those folks to become citizens. The wall. Let's do what's most effective for border security. I don't care if it's a wall, I don't care if it's technology or people. You're going to take your taxpayer dollars and use it, let's use it in the most efficient manner to secure the border. As I said in my opening statement, we're a nation of immigrants. That is what makes America a great nation. It's our diversity and we should celebrate that diversity. What's tragic is, you know, I spend a lot of time visiting elementary schools and you know, when you go into elementary school and some of those school teachers talk about third and fourth grade students that are worried that their parents won't be there when they get home. Is that who we are as a nation? No, I don't believe that is who we are. So there is an urgency of solving this. Absolutely, you know, we've heard some of my Republican colleagues say they'd support a, a clean dream bill and a dream act. Great, if we get in the majority, I would argue that should be the first piece of legislation we introduce to protect these kids. Secondly, I think we have to start addressing immigration and pass comprehensive immigration reform. We did have a bill that was broadly supported in a bipartisan way out of the Senate. Let's bring that bill back. We should want the best and brightest around the world to be able to come here. We should also show our compassion because there are refugees around the world that need that safety. We should welcome them. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. We are out of time for policy questions. Uh, thanks again to, to both of you for responding thoughtfully to these important issues. With that, we will allow each candidate to provide a two-minute closing statement. We will start with Dr. Barra. Once again, I just want to thank APAPA for their leadership um, in this candidate forum and their leadership across the, the country. You know, it's been an honor to serve our community as a doctor for the past 23 years. To, to help address and, and bring health care to this community and to be your member of Congress. 
um, these last six years. I do believe in America, and I do believe that the future of this region and the future of this country is a bright future. But we have to be willing to work together. We have to be able to listen to one another and fight to move forward. It's again been your honor to be your member of Congress. I would be honored to have your support and your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everyone coming. I know it's a Sunday afternoon, and I should be out walking precincts and talking to people, but the chance to meet all of you together at one time has been phenomenal. First of all, thank you, Abba, a Papa, again, for having us. CC, wherever you are, uh, you founded something that's amazing. You've empowered a lot of people through this. Um, but let me talk a little bit about who I am and who you would be delivering to Washington, D.C. to get work done. I'm a fighter, straight and simple. This community needs a fighter back in Washington, D.C. Whether your party or politics or special interests or corruption or anything happening back there, sometimes, in those cases, those things are, of course, going against you, and you have to have someone to stand up to say no to that. That's what I am doing. That's what I have been doing my whole life in public service. Uh, that's what I would do back in Washington, D.C. Someone once 